Hi, this is your host, Sapna Bharti, and welcome to TFI Insights, it's sponsored by Rackan. It's a show where we deep dive into cloud native technologies. And today we have with us once again CEO and co founder of Rackan, Rob Hirschfeld. And today we are going to get some updates on Cloud 2030. Just for a quick reminder to our audience, what exactly is 2030 Cloud? Cloud 2030, um, the website is the2030.cloud. Uh, is a set of weekly discussions where we talk about the future. It's a very unique session. It's it's very open. It's very hallway track type formatted. And we look at how are we building technologies and infrastructures for the future? What are the impacts, concerns? What's going to change it? How is the market going to evolve? Um, and with an eye towards can we influence what's being built and do we like what's being built? So let's talk about some of the really interesting topics that you folks are discussing at uh, uh, Cloud 2030. One is um, SaaS economics, which is where we talk about CapEx versus OpEx. Uh, so so let's talk about get into this because ownership, cost of ownership does become a big uh, topic. When you look at uh, one or two years, it's fine. But when you look at 10, 15 years, that becomes a serious topic. The thing that really jumped out to me in the discussions was that, you know, everybody everybody has this idea that we prefer CapEx over, sorry, OpEx over CapEx, meaning incremental investments, pay-as-you-go type models. And, and that's pretty hardwired in people's expectation at this point. But we went deeper because we were looking 10 years out. And the idea here is that that model of acquiring technology influences how we plan to build innovation. And the, the way we're actually buying incremental technology and not needing the startup capital, not needing to bi build infrastructures to innovate changes the way we expect innovation to be built. And so the thing that was fascinating in 2030.cloud is that we really impacted how the systems are built in the future. Like we're relying on the fact that we can get incremental ads to technology and build things incrementally, that we don't need the startup costs and the startup capital. And so we were, we were excited and also concerned, which is a theme for, for the discussions, that we've really accelerated the pace of innovation, but made it in a way that we have all of these dependencies on CapEx, oh, sorry, OpEx infrastructures. Uh, and that can be a challenge based on the way we've traditionally innovated, where you invest and that investment pays off over time. The investment isn't necessary in a lot of cases anymore. We also talk a lot about complexity, especially if you look at uh, the CNCF landscape. There are so many logos. You need a really 32K monitor. You cannot do any more in 4K. It's, it's good to have so many choices, but it also leads to a, a lot of comp Kubernetes itself needs a lot of knobs to be turned. But when you look at all the projects that are there, so uh, uh, we are talking about you know Javon's complexity paradox. So first of all, tell me what is that? Before that, you if you can a little bit just give us you know how complicated cloud native landscape is today. This concept uh, comes up over and over again, and we we talk about how complex things are and the the rate at which complexity is increasing. Uh, and you can see that in the cloud native landscape. You can see it in the way we're building a lot of these pieces. The thing that's really interesting is in these discussions, people don't seem to get as concerned about complexity and interdependency in systems as you would expect. And we, we, ex we now predict that systems will get increasingly complex. And when we step back from that, we start scratching our head, why is complexity not adding cost? Normally when things get more and more complex, they get more fragile, they get more expensive, they become harder to maintain. But what we've been seeing and expect to continue is this idea that the complexity that we're inheriting is not seen by the people making those decisions. So Jevons paradox is a, is a paradox where as something becomes cheaper and less expensive, people consume more of it. Uh, think of gasoline with more fuel efficient cars. People drive more because the unit costs, the unit economics have actually made it less expensive. You get more work. We are seeing something similar going on with complexity, where the cost of adding dramatic complexity into a system is not being felt by the people building the system. Think of all of our AI and ML infrastructures, where you can add machine learning into a, an application stack without having to do any of the work to build the machine learning models, the algorithms, the compute infrastructures. You just get it. 
and can add it into your applications. That type of additional complexity is very real, but it's not being felt by the consumers and the builders. So what we're doing is we're making systems increasingly complex at a faster and faster rate, and we're not seeing the cost of that complexity. That's a Jevons paradox in complexity. Uh, and so the question that we've been asking is, is this a sustainable thing or are we just hiding technical debt in places that people don't know? And so when we look towards the future, uh, the, the overall complexity of the systems we're building is expanding dramatically and faster and faster. Um, and what we don't quite know is if it's a sustainable pace or not. And so there are definitely failure scenarios that, that we talk about where security or regulation or just the complexity itself uh, with, with supply chain um, fragility could actually send the whole system crumbling. Yeah. One thing I want to ask you, this could be off topic, uh, is that uh, as in today's world, especially because of this pandemic, uh, it, it is quite clear that uh, modern businesses, they have to be software companies as well. You cannot be a business without any software stack, you know, serving your customers. So it doesn't matter what you do. And then uh, cloud is a critical piece of, you know, software alone, you know, you're not running anything on your local computer, you're running a cloud. Now, when we look at this cloud native complexity, if you do want to move faster, if you do want to build your services, and if you look at this complex complexity, it's overwhelming, it's, inter it's, it's very, very intimidating. That is why we see a lot of, you know, popularity of low code or no code where you don't need to know much about what is running under in the you can quickly move faster but the challenge is that if you yourself do not know what services are or what technology is powering your own business you are in a very dangerous situation you should know and right now you may be a small company you're just moving for but as your company grows if you become a target for acquisition and if you're touching a lot of open source code and if you do not even know what is running in your own stack, you lead, it leads to a lot of security issue. It leads to a lot of compliance issue, you know, where you may be violating a lot of open source licenses. Uh, SaaS does make it easier. Can you can you talk about the balance here? Because when I look at it, I would like, yes, it's it, it enables people to move quickly, but you deal with the clients a lot. So do you see a trend where companies they get started with no code or low code or you know easy, but then as they grow, they try to gain insights into the software stack or they are like, oh my God, what are we doing? I'd be happy to. This is actually connecting the other two topics, right? We have this increase in OPEX generated innovation, meaning I can rent somebody selling me a solution and fixing something with the SaaS and hide all that complexity. And yet at the same time, as we grow the, our dependence on those things, the need to understand what they are, understand our supply chain, protect ourselves from risk, um, those things start to come to the fore. And we do see companies that are starting to evaluate their end-to-end -end systems and then pull back. The, the way I see this is that things have been evolving and moving really quickly as technologies. We don't entirely understand how everything is getting built or what's required or what's necessary. And some of those things are gonna shake out that we're gonna pull back and look at the overall stacks that people are building and then try to, to streamline them, simplify them. Today, we've made a very balkanized market where somebody says, oh, I have Kubernetes, but I also need these six products to make Kubernetes work correctly. Six is probably a low number for most people. Um, and those things, you know, over time, are going to consolidate into single products and then simplify it. And once you've done that, then you could actually potentially buy that product, add it in and run it yourself. Um, and so I expect as, as this Jevons complexity paradox hits, there's a, an outcome where people look at that and say, this is not a sustainable pace. I need to pull back. That's traditionally the pendulum swing back to simplicity. Or it could be that this is actually a sustainable model and, and things will go forward. Um, and in that, in that uh, you know, it's, that's a harder model to predict because we've never seen systems as complex as we've built. Um, one thing that's been really interesting, we've talked about serverless technology quite a bit. Uh, it's almost surprising to me we get into what I think is a economics conversation or an access conversation or an open source conversation, and it gets pulled into a serverless conversation or event-driven computing. And the reason that keeps happening in these discussions is because that is one of the ways people expect to cope with complexity. 
if I've built my data center, my infrastructure, and my software stack to consume a lot of these small services that hide complexity, I need to glue them together. And serverless is what people see as the way to glue or cope with this increasing complexity. So this is where it's possible that all this added complexity will be managed for us by having a serverless event-driven system at the heart of all our computing. And we'll continue to see that trend rise. Um, that's a pretty predictable trend. The systems are complex. Serverless helps uh, manage the complexity. It certainly doesn't reduce it. One thing with serverless is that it's okay for uh, relatively smaller companies, but if you look at a lot of companies, they do a lot of things on-prem. So even if you do talk about serverless, there is a server that they have to ma uh, manage and maintain. So are we talking about only those companies who are going full on SaaS, they don't have anything on-prem, but if you look at the company who do do a lot of things with on-prem, I think Reckon also helps in that uh, space as well. So how does serverless help those companies who are managing a server either way? Yeah, serverless sadly is one of the worst names for a computing model that uh, the industry could have come up with. It's really just event processing. So you know there there is no doubt, uh, and Reckon works very hard to make servers easier and easier to manage. One of the things that we see in Cloud 2030 is there is an explosion of innovation going on the hardware side. Um, edge computing, ARM, RISC, uh, new hardware models, smart NICs, right? There, there's a lot of opportunity to improve the physical layers of the IT infrastructure we depend on also. And that's completely separated. It'll end up being hidden as a platform um, for consumers the and, and users and, and application builders. But because all these things are being decomposed as services, those services have to be connected together. And that's what the event system will do, what we would call serverless computing. So they're not at all incompatible. As a matter of fact, that event-driven system will be the core glue, even more than Kubernetes has been or virtualization has been. Um, that, you know, it's a necessary piece to connect all of these uh, disparate software stacks that we're building together. So uh, Ben, you're talking about serverless, or when we are looking at serverless, we are not looking at you know the serverless that marketing teams like to call about. It's, it's more or less like how you do things even on your prem as well. That is what, and that's what you know. Even even when you say VMs and virtual machines, you know you're you you are creating those VMs on your bare metal. You know it's not everything. So so it's more or less like the process, the approach you are adopting to event driven approach, right? Now let's uh, let's talk about. Uh, uh, the another topic is uh, hyperscale. Uh, the kind of narrative is changing around uh, hyperscale. Uh, what kind of discussions are going on in that space? So one one of the things that we see is a general concern about hyperscalers. So you know, without going into too much detail in, in these conversations, the thing that's interesting is we all expect hyperscalers to continue to be dominant and the key players in the industry, and it doesn't take any real um, discovery to realize that most people are concerned about the scope of power and control of these companies. Um, and then that leads us very quickly into realizing that geopolitical boundaries and supply chains will ultimately influence how these, how these companies behave. Uh, and so we do have expectations that as these companies become ever more powerful, that other forces will step in and disrupt the, the, their dominance, either by creating geopolitical challenges, um, monopolistic breakups, things like that. And so we do see that the trend line for hyperscalers is it's gonna be very impossible to disrupt without having some type of external influence, the disasters, governments, um, some type of major security or, or supply chain problem. One thing that we cannot not talk about, which is ironically kind of elephant in the room, right? It's actually not elephant, which is edge. I do remember some discussions around uh, ARM when ARM developers, they were trying to get a lot of uh, their code into Linux kernel and they were looking for energy efficiency. And if you look at Intel AMD folks, they're like, we don't care. We have big, massive data centers, but our people were worried about that. And if you look at today's world, all those codes that was contributed or taken by the arms, they are now saving millions of dollars in heat or efficiency in data centers today. So those changes do make a lot of impact even you at that point you see, hey, we don't need it. So I look at edge also, that edge is also driving a lot of things that you may not consider in, you know, 
other use cases. So can you talk about the impact of edge, whether it's about, you know, performance, utilization, talk about how edge is impacting not only the use cases, but the stack itself. So edge is really this place where we see computing coming into daily life in, in even more and more dramatic ways. And one of the things that was fascinating uh, is that when you think about how we are starting to push technology deeper into our lives and needing to conserve energy and preserve uh, power, you know, supply chains and, and balance all of the resource constraints that we, we have um, and connect to everybody else, the need for more and more computing at the edge in our environment local to us will only increase, especially with cross-connected systems and coordination. And, and that's, that's a, a critical part of life. Um, ARM is going to be a part of that. It's going to be a very heterogeneous, uh, diverse system. Um, not as not like big cloud providers where everything is the same or very homogeneous or centrally managed. Um, and so one of the things that we do see is that trend line will continue to accelerate. Today, it's a bit of a mess. Uh, and we expect that we will continue to see a lot of evolution in this space. Um, but there is no doubt at all that our dependence on computing as a core infrastructure is going to increase dramatically. Uh, and the 2030 crowd isn't particularly enthusiastic about what we see at the moment um, for this, but we do see needing to have standardization, better management, being able to have systems that we can really rely on our core components. And that's a topic that we, ex we will be continuing to talk about in the future because it's a place where we feel like there's some influence, um, where you know, think, figuring out how to connect all these pieces together will make a big difference. And I'd love to have people come into the, con the conversation and, and help us figure this out, right? We actually can, can impact all of these technologies and think about ways in which our daily lives are influenced and can make changes to the future. Rob, thank you so much for sharing these uh, very interesting and very important discussions that are going on within uh, uh, 2030 Cloud community. And, and these are also the discussions which are going to influence and drive uh, the, the space, the ecosystem itself. This is going to be an interesting year. Uh, last year was a bit where companies are rushing towards cloud native technologies. They were moving quickly and now things are settling down. Technologies like even Kubernetes and things are they're mature. I mean, they are mature, but they have moved into the uh, deployment phase. So this year will be very, very interesting how things further consolidate. So thanks for this discussion and I look forward to talk to you again. Thanks, Swap. I appreciate the time. And if you're listening, please come in, join us, the2030.cloud. We're having these discussions weekly. Um, they open up uh, to ideas that really just blow me away, where we really think about the impacts of the technologies and how they're getting shaped in the future. So I'm looking forward to you know, expanding these, com these conversations and bringing in even more people. <laughs>